Thank you. So I should say I'm talking about some successes and challenges. Uh, coming from our group, Biomedical Image Analysis Group at Imperial College London, the successes I'm talking about are mostly biased towards what we have done so far. Of course, there's a lot of success these days um, in medical imaging using deep learning. And I want to use a few minutes to reflect a little bit uh, why we are now looking into deep learning in medical image analysis. There's really this rise of deep learning. I guess that's the reason why, um, why we are all here. So I did this query on PubMed, the publication database uh, for medical uh, and clinical publications. <clears throat> if you query for machine learning in the title and abstract, then you have this nice trend, quite, quite predictable with the trend of uh, using more and more data driven approaches. However, if you do something similar with deep learning, it's less of this trend, it's more of a disruption. So you basically see there wasn't much at all, and then very suddenly there was this huge jump in the number of publications. So a few years ago there wasn't really much, and I guess this is the third uh, deep learning summit in healthcare. So you can see that they were right at the beginning of, of the trend when, when they started these summits. Before deep learning, actually, what we were mostly using are more classical machine learning techniques. So I stole here the scikit-learn algorithm uh, cheat sheet. Uh, scikit-learn is a Python library, uh, a very successful, widely used uh, open source machine learning library. It has lots of classical machine learning techniques, very nice, uh, nicely developed. And basically, they gave you this guide, so whenever you had a data uh, science problem, you could follow this guide, you could find out which technique to use, whether it's a classification, a regression, a dimensionality reduction technique. And it seems if you look at the literature now, you can all, all, do all of this basically with deep learning. Right? So then in particular in medical image analysis, um, a particular technique that we were using quite a lot and very successfully before deep learning was based on decision trees. So most clinicians are, are used to use decision trees and we found ways of using randomized decision trees, um, which were very successfully applied to machine learning, uh, to, to medical image analysis problems, but also computer vision problems. And the reason why they are nice to use is because they are quite interpretable. So you have these decisions to make that tell you whether a feature is useful or not, and it can separate your data. And then in the leaf nodes, you can make uh, decisions. And at test time, you just follow a path in the decision tree. And that was very useful. And, and scaling this up was also uh, quite possible by trying to start building deeper and deeper trees. So you would, were using lots of features from your data and that in particular in medical imaging we saw was uh, quite, quite useful. So there was a time before deep learning where everyone started to use uh, random forests for all kinds of things. Because we saw when we put together lots of decision trees, we get very strong classifiers. But then came deep learning. And really, it has changed like the field a lot. So these days, people wouldn't consider random forest as their first choice. They might just go with a standard uh, convolutional neural network as a baseline to get, to get an idea how difficult the problem is. And the reason is why or where the power of deep learning is really if you compare decision trees, for instance, to neural networks, then we already know for quite some time that you can represent a decision tree with a neural network which simply has two hidden layers. So all the decision nodes of a tree are on the first hidden layer and all your leaf nodes are on the second hidden layer. And that's how you can perfectly represent a decision tree with a, a two-layer neural network. Now, if you build deeper trees where you get the more discriminative uh, predictive power from in decision trees, the interesting thing is to note is that you don't get deeper networks. You simply get wider networks. So a deeper tree mapped again to a neural network gives you a wider network, but not a deeper one. And the deep is where we get uh, the power, uh, I guess, in deep learning techniques. So if you look at what models are used these days, you have lots of hidden layers stacked on top of each other. And this stacking of hidden layers allows you to learn these very complex um, data associations between your input data and your output data. And that's where the power is coming from. So just to give you some successes from our own lab where we have applied uh, in the last couple of years deep learning techniques, uh, I want to show you some results from brain lesions, fetal imaging, and also cardiac uh, image analysis. So the first one is on brain lesions. 
Um, so this is work that we have already started to present last year where we started with this. Uh, so one of my PhD student, Kostos, who is here in the audience, uh, if you want to raise your hand. Yes, because he can answer your detailed questions afterwards. So he came up with this architecture. So we used a, a relatively standard convolutional neural network, made it possible to process large 3D imaging. So this is done on 3D volumetric brain scans. And we used a multi-resolution approach because it helped us to incorporate uh, local but also spatial contextual information. And that worked pretty well. So this network allowed us to come up with a system that was able to analyze a 3D scan and give us a 3D, a very accurate map of where the network believes there are lesions. So this was done on brain lesions, people that have accidents uh, and, and thus maybe have contusions in the brain. But it equally works well for things like brain tumors or ischemic stroke lesions. And here's just some visual results. Um, of course, there's a, a proper evaluation of this in, in our publications. And using these techniques, we found that we can actually apply it to quite um, other applications, but which are similar, similar in nature. So the next application we did last year, so Amir Alansari, another PhD student in our group, used this network for fetal imaging. So he came up with an architecture, so this is where the uh, methodology part of a paper goes in, where you describe how your architecture looks like. You might do certain adaptations to your previous model. Um, so he came up with a few steps that he needed to uh, process that data in particular, and I'm just showing you some results. So this is, again, MRI imaging of fetuses uh, very at ver very young age. So this is a quite new imaging technique that is developed together with King's College London. And what we are interested in here really is to analyze these scans and to be able to extract, for instance, the organs of the fetus, <coughs> because this would allow us to make use of it, for instance, for diagnostic purposes. We want to see whether the baby grows at a normal, normal rate. So we want to analyze the brain, the spinal cord, the, the inner organs. But we also found that with this technique, we can do a very challenging task of placenta segmentation. So placenta, is, uh, the, the positioning and the shape of the placenta is quite crucial. And it uh, allows you to predict whether a pregnancy would follow a normal trajectory. So the, with this technique, we are now able to analyze these 3D scans and actually make use of them in clinical practice. So the next success I would say uh, I want to discuss is cardiac analysis. Uh, this is work done by Ozan Oktai, who's also here somewhere in the audience. If you can raise your hand as well. So he can ask, answer also some questions. So the problem with cardiac is if you want to image the heart, it's very difficult because it's always moving. So normally what you do when you again use MRI, for instance, you would do slice-wise acquisition. And if you put a slice at a certain position of the heart, you get a nice 2D video, but then you want in, uh, at the end what you want is a 3D volumetric uh, video, basically a 4D image of the heart. So if you take another slice, you get another video, and you get another slice, you get another video. The problem is you now need to stack them together. And because this has to be done relatively quickly because the heart is moving all the time, if you just stack them together as they are acquired, you have to use these thick slices. So instead of having a nice 3D volume, you have a stack of 2D slices, which are actually quite low resolution if you look at them from the uh, non-scanning uh, direction. So Ozan was coming up with this uh, network architecture that would allow us to upsample those images. It's a super resolution network. It allows you to basically interpolate um, towards a higher resolution 3D scan. So yeah, just some uh, visual results. You see on the left the original data set, and then you see a standard upsample, like using linear interpolation uh, on the right uh, next to it. And then you see the result coming out from a deep learning neural network. And comparing this to a ground truth 3D scan, you actually see that you get quite close. So you even preserve nicely some of the uh, small uh, details. Now you might wonder why, if I can actually acquire a full 3D scan, why would I want to upsample a lower resolution 2D scan? The one on the most right is not something you would do in clinical practice because it takes much, much longer time. It's ECG triggered and it's not something that is used in, in clinical routine. 
Now, the images itself probably you wouldn't use for doing diagnosis because you kind of hallucinate some information. You upsample an image and you might introduce something that wasn't there. So, you wouldn't use it for diagnosis, but what you can use it for is further analysis. For instance, we found that you can use it for doing image segmentation, so you can extract the 3D shape of the cardiac, and it's nicer than doing it on the interpolated image, and it's very close to the one that you would get on the full 3D high-resolution scan. So this you see on the most right, where you see this little discrepancy in red is coming from the linear interpolated image, and the green one is from our uh, upsampled uh, 3D image. So this is all nice, and we, we make good success here in terms of we have new applications applying deep learning on exciting clinical applications. We can write papers about it. But while doing this, we also realized that there are quite some challenges. And I guess today there was already a lot of talk about different types of challenges. So I want to discuss three challenges that we uh, saw in particular with respect to medical imaging. So the first one is about learning the right features. The second is detecting when it goes wrong. And the third one is how can we go beyond human level performance? So learning the right features might sound weird in a deep learning context because you would hope that your artificial neural network would just do the right thing, right? So you give it the data. You don't have to worry about handcrafting, designing features. You just let it discover the right features from the data. The problem is with a simple example, I want to show you that that might not always work. So very often, in, in particular in medical imaging, you might get a training data set from a site, one hospital, and that might look like this. So you have examples, maybe even labeled, what is the malignant uh, cell, what is a benign cell or structure, and you want to learn features how to discriminate them. If you give that training data set to a neural network, what it will learn is that malignant uh, objects have this orangeness uh, in, their, in their appearance, and benign things are probably green. However, usually what's happening then when you get new data from another site, you might have data like this, where you suddenly see that your learned network or your trained network is completely failing on your test data, simply because it learned the wrong features. And that there's nothing that would stop the neural network to go for color because of the most obvious discriminative feature in the first place in your training data. <clears throat> now, you might say that's a problem with your training data, and yes, that's right, that is a problem with the training data. But in medical imaging, it is simply not possible to always have a data set that is representative of every possible source of, uh, of data. There might be a new scanner coming up that didn't exist when you have built your product. So Costas, again, worked on extending his convolutional neural networks by using something that we just discussed a little bit, which is adversarial nets. So we use this to do what we call unsupervised domain adaptation, or what is called unsupervised domain adaptation. And the idea here really is that you learn your standard neural network. So let's say you want to do brain tumor segmentation. You learn a network, an image segmentation network, a convolutional neural network that does this. Now, at the same time, <coughs> what you try to do is you have a, um, uh, another network that looks at the learned representations and what you try to do is you try to figure out where the data is coming from. Now, if you train such a network on data, on labeled data that is coming from your state A, and you have another data set that doesn't have to be labeled, which comes from site B, that first network, the image segmentation network, will try to learn features which are invariant to where the data is coming from. Right? And, and this allows you to uh, mitigate exactly that problem. It wouldn't learn for the previous example <coughs> the color is the discriminative feature, it would learn that it's actually the shape that would discriminate the two structures, because that's what makes them invariant to where the data is coming from. So this worked really well. So we tested this again on brain lesions, where we had MRI brain data coming from different uh, sites, so basically two different MR scanners. And in one of them, they acquire a certain set of MR sequences, and in the other one, they almost acquire the same, but there was a slight difference, because they changed to a new sequence in the MRR acquisition, which actually made our previous network that was trained on uh, data from, from the one scanner completely fail on the second scanner. However, after using the domain adaptation, 
uh, using the adversarial nets, our network went up to the performance that it got on the first, uh, first uh, site, even on the other uh, data from the new scanner, without using any annotations, just, just training the network <coughs> to discriminate or to not discriminate where the data is coming from, helped us to get back to the performance and learn the right features. <coughs> so the second challenge is about detecting when it goes wrong. So very often when you build these neural networks, the problem is you have this development cycle. If you build a neural network, you do validation and testing, you look at your learning curves, you do modifications on your network, and you, you live in this cycle. So at least in academia, we often live in this cycle, and then every nth iteration we try to publish a paper. Now the problem is, at some point you want to use those uh, systems in clinical practice. So if you go to the de deployment and you use now a trained neural network on data that is acquired in the hospital, what you might find is that it doesn't work so well. The problem is how do you know? How do you know that it doesn't work well? You could look at the images and you could try to do some sort of manual quality control. Or you could annotate data, but that's not feasible at scale. You can't always look at, if you have a large scale data uh, analysis, you can't look at every single case <coughs> and check whether your network worked well or not. So what we are trying to do here is basically we try to figure out to automatically recognize when something goes wrong, but not on average, but on a per subject basis. So we came up with this framework reverse classification accuracy, which is um, of course based on previous work on reverse testing and reverse validation. But really the idea here is to use this within a medical imaging setup where we say there is normally some training data, some reference data, for which we know what the, uh, what the true labels are, at least the ones that we believe are the best possible we can get. Those are usually used to train a network, so you learn a system, you learn a machine learning method, a convolutional neural network, something that you can then deploy in practice. Now, on your new data, you get a prediction, and the question is, how good is this prediction? Every time you want to know, did it fail or did it do a reasonable job? You can use the prediction and train what we call a reverse classifier. So that is a classifier that is completely overfitted to that one example. But you can use it to make predictions again, because it was trained on so-called pseudo ground truth, so something on, on a prediction. So now if you go back to your training data, you can actually check how well does the reverse classifier work on your training data. And of course it might not work well at all, and in particular it might not work on all of them, but it might actually work on some of them. And it might work on the ones that are very close to your testing data. And now on this one, you can actually, of course, quantify. You can get a number, a, a quality score, a metric that tells you how well could you segment the training data by using the prediction on your test data. And we show, we show that this is actually uh, well correlated with the true performance that you would get on your um, test data. So we tested this on multi-organ segmentation in whole body MRI, but in the meantime also on cardiac imaging. But just to show you a plot, so this is on the x-axis the real dice score, so it's one segmentation quality metric that measures overlap between a predicted segmentation and a ground truth manual segmentation. And you see that the predicted score that we get automatically correlates very well with the real score. So you could use this, for instance, to automatically detect by setting a threshold, for instance, on the predicted score uh, if uh, a system has failed. So now the last challenge I want to discuss is how can we go beyond human level performance? Now, we already see, although there's a lot of talk about reaching human level performance for many tasks. But the question is how can we go beyond and what are the limiting factors, in particular in medical imaging? Now obviously, it's somewhere in the data that is generated where we say we have ground truth. We never have ground truth. We have something that an expert provided us. So we try to find the best expert we can, but still, of course, there will be a lot of uh, variation in the quality of annotations. So they have to sit down and have this very tedious and time-consuming job of very detailed annotations in medical imaging. And of course, if we train methods that aim to replicate this, it's very difficult to go beyond, right? So you can maybe reach the performance of the best expert, but ideally, at some point, we want to use this to be better than humans. 
So one idea of this, or I think one direction, promising direction would be, is to really think about synthesizing ground truth. We don't want to rely on experts and their time and doing the annotations. We want to generate data for which we know the ground truth. And this could be done by synthesis. We have, I think, heard about uh, GANs, which are one way of synthesizing data. And we have seen maybe all some uh, recent works on that. So the idea would be really, what if we could draw a manual segmentation label map and have a network that would produce uh, us the corresponding image because then we really have the matching input and output data and it could be considered ground truth. So this is work in progress. I don't know how many people have seen this last week or the week before coming up uh, on the web where people came up with a tool where you can draw outlines of cats and it will produce you an image of a cat. So this is called Edges to Cats. I actually, I thought, that's exactly what I would like to have for my medical imaging, right? So I want to draw something on the left, and I want to get a cat on the right. Or in my case, I want to have an MRI scan. So I, I looked at a few of those examples, and they are actually quite entertaining. And you see some nice results here, some not so nice results, some scary results. <coughs> you might get a cat with a few more eyes here. And obviously, I was tempted to try this and wanted to get my medical image out of this, but it didn't really work. So I guess there's still a lot of work for us to do, but uh, I hope with these challenges, I gave you some, uh, some idea where we are currently with our research. And of course, thanks to all our funders.